Hi, everyone. Hello, all you beautiful faces. I just want to jump through the screen and give you all kisses and hugs, consensually, of course. <laughs> so <t> tonight we have uh, Sir Daddy Don, um, who is based in the U.S. <laughs> is based golf truck driver and MS title holder and lots of fun things has been in the community for a very long time and so we've invited her here tonight to kind of tell us some stories about how she came into the community and and what it's like to be a leather woman in today versus a while back and how she got here. So if you'd like to go ahead with that, Sir Daddy Don, and uh, just tell us about how you came into leather in the community. I'm not sure we have that much time, but I, I will do my best. <laughs> Hi everybody, how are you this evening? Take your um, time. Uh, how I came into the community. From, I think it was more the way that I was raised. Um, family, um, my mom is very domineering. <clears throat> um, so I, we grew up serving others and the, the community, our town, our church as a whole. And service appealed to my heart. It made sense to me, um, made me feel worthwhile. I, I didn't know how to actually be without service. And so after I got done with high school and moved up to Seattle, um, I was probably 19 or 20, I know, underage, but I was watching all these groups of women um, that were, they were like little, I wouldn't say they were gangs, but they were, there were certainly packs of women that obviously had something about them that intrigued me. And I, being the little, the little butch boy that I was at the time started following them around. And um, I actually started my journey on the other side of the slash. Um, I found a formal household to train with. And I was with my first mistress for about two and a half years um, in a formal house of 15. And that's kind of what started my journey. Very nice. Very nice. What made you come over to the other side of the flash <laughs> I didn't want to it, it was a long <laughs> hard-fought battle um my mistress actually was uh quite a bit older than me and, and after she passed away I I looked I wanted I needed um obviously I love serving femmes anyone who knows me knows this about me um I know <laughs> um I needed a strong femme who wouldn't take advantage and allow me to serve in the way that I that that I felt came natural. And five or six years later, by then I had moved down to Portland, still hadn't really really found anyone that it really clicked with yet. And um, what happened is I realized I looked around and had four or five little little puppies following me around. Now, not the kind of puppies of today, but the puppies of back then. And right. they were all calling me daddy. And I realized that that is what I actually had to give the community and transitioned into being daddy. Nice. Nice. Now, you've had, um, you've had some time in the community um, with the court um, circuit also, right? Yeah. So I, is there a quite a bit of overlap for you there? And I completely believe there is, yeah. Um, I got involved with, the, with Portland's Imperial Sovereign Rose Court probably in 92, 93. I actually was um, Ms. Gate Portland number seven back in 1994, 95, something like that. But again, it had the 
there are rules and protocols and ways to be and um, certainly opportunities to serve. And so that's, that's what I love so much about the court system. Good. Good. I love it. I love it. And I have to say, seeing the pictures of you in a suit, <laughs> this is fire. That is a whole different fire. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So coming over into, um, the community kind of as it is today how was how was it much different when you started versus today oh criminy <clears throat> I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start um and i would say i i actually probably don't have much of an answer for what you're looking for the the community I was involved with in Portland, you know, was more of a um, BDSM kink based community. And I, I actually stepped away from that probably about 12 years ago. Um, and so when I, I really haven't been part of that style of community, I've been more focused on um, obviously the master slave and the dynamics. And, you know, so that's kind of my, my groove now so but how that's changed is that um certainly the the master slave community what it is today was not you know was not around 30 35 years ago um even when it started you know like the the international title system when all that started it was so different for for women um that it was just it it wasn't like it is today. It wasn't as open, you know, and right. as much as it is today. Did uh, well? Did you find that um, that years ago? So as it as it kind of is now, we're really making inroads into men's spaces. Did you um, did you ever really come across that kind of an issue back? you know, back in your early days of not being led into places, not really being accepted. Oh, yes. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I was kicked out of the ego in Seattle, um, the old ego in Portland, um, several different leather bars in San Francisco, um, kicked out because I, I was a woman. What, what opened the door for me was the fact that the men realized in the mid 80s, um, mid to late 80s, when um, AIDS um, was the major catastrophe at the time, all the lesbians were the ones that, you know, would go in and help out, um, you know, the gentlemen that were, were passing. And so if I needed to get a hold of a partner or, you know, a family member, um, because so and so needed them, or or they had passed, and I needed to pass on that information. The men quickly realized that I was one of the few that were willing to, you know, come running through the door and say, "Hey, I need some help." And that that situation is what kind of opened the door for me with the men's, you know, group. But it, even now, if I was to try to walk into, mm, I mean, I certainly would be welcome in a male, you know, leather bar. It's just the energy isn't something that I choose to, you know, to participate in. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, for stepping up back then. I was still a kid during the AIDS crisis. And, um, and so really did not have a way to get involved. Didn't, didn't know anyone personally um, other than one friend of my mom's. And I remember my mom um, being the only person at work that would um, that would check on John and pick him pick him up for work and kind of be his uh, kind of be his advocate and friend. And it's I think that really set an example for me because even as a very conservative woman, she. Um, she understood the, uh, you know, the humanity in everyone, and 
wanted to reach out and help. And that, so as, you know, as I got older, I started helping with um, AIDS Project of the Ozarks and really tried to do whatever I can in my neck of the woods. Right. And so that that's important. And I, I love that you told that also. Um, tell us a little bit about your um, about your girl, your dynamic <laughs> or dynamic. There may be other ones I don't even know about. So, <laughs> I've I've actually had um, I won't say many, but several dynamics throughout the years. Um, daddy boy, daddy girl. Um, obviously, they all failed. I I don't I didn't know the the verbiage. I didn't know what I was looking for. Um, I also didn't know what I had to offer. Um, in April of 2011, nope, 2010, it's been 10 years now, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And at that point, I was very, very sick. Um, I was actually given about six months. I was, I was that sick. Um, the doctors didn't think I would last much longer. And so it was just kind of known that I, I needed some help. I was, I was physically very struggling. Um, my girl happens to be best friends um, with another friend of mine. And she heard of the situation and literally showed up on my doorstep and said, um, I want to serve you. I, I want to be your slave. Will you be my master? And I kicked her out after I burst out laughing. I said that, yeah, no, this, this isn't going to work. I, I don't understand. You're cute, but you need to go. Yeah, it's not going to work. Um, she just kept pushing. She just kept showing up. She just kept doing all the things. And um, I realized that I did need her help, that she understood how to help me. And um, that started what today is, shoot, we're on eight years now. Sweet. And, um, yeah. Yep. Love of my life. <laughs> She's a very special person for sure. <laughs> um and speaking on that, um, you guys have not had the the easiest time over the last few years, you know. And and then adding to that the close confines of trucking life and so Tell us about that, like how, um, you know, how things aren't always sunshine and roses and how you get through that. <laughs> you know, um, I, when, when girl J first um, offered her service, I was, I was with my other partner at the time and realized that that was a very toxic situation for me. And so I left that situation and put myself in a semi truck. And I said, one, if I'm going to die from this stupid multiple sclerosis, I want to do it on the road. And I, I need to heal. Now I need to figure out who I am again and decide who I want to be going forward. So I, I drove solo for a little over a year. Um, girl Jay and I talked and I saw her a couple times, but, but I was on the road. And I finally realized that. It, it was time to either sink, you know, swim or sink, one one or the other. Um, it it wasn't something I could keep talking about. Um, it wasn't going to be a trial and error situation. I'm just not that type of person. So I went to Portland to see her for the weekend, and I said, um, "Quit your job, pack your bag, and get in the truck." <laughs> um, that was five years ago now, and I would say the first. The first probably six to eight months were the hardest that we struggled because one, there's a, there's a huge age difference. There's 23 years between us. Um, I've been a truck driver since I was 15. So I'm kind of really set in my ways. It's my truck. Um, you know, leave me alone. Um, and we had these huge communication issues that we, we because we hadn't been you know, in this close proximity together for long amount periods of time. So yeah, now all of a sudden we're in less than 50 square feet, 24 hours a day, 
and both of our triggers kept coming up and you know our issues that we were stumbling around you know um, i'm very slow to anger when i get frustrated i'm very loud and explosive and then it's done then i'm going to ask you what's for dinner in the next heartbeat um jay's completely the opposite not that she's quick to anger but once she gets angry it takes her she's like a teapot you know you have to let it all cool down and calm down and i'm, I'm not that way so we really had to had to get in there and and work on our communication um figure out what was important to both of us why we were why we were here and find ways to learn to trust each other um it probably took a good six months before we realized that both of us had this, you know, if, if, if the voices got a little bit louder, if we had a disagreement, she thought I was going to kick her out of the truck. And I thought for sure she was just going to leave me. So, you know, we were both struggling with the same insecurities. And we didn't even realize that. But um, once we got that, the pattern down, the protocol for how to deal with any type of issue, it doesn't matter what it is. Once we had those rules in place, and literally it's a list of, you know, steps that we both go through, um, then no matter what comes up, that's just how you deal with it. And the more times, it's like anything, the more times you go through that pattern, then you realize it's not even, you don't have to think about the list. You just, you just both keep moving on. Yeah. Yeah. So I like it. Here, there's a question in the chat. What does it mean to you to be a daddy? How do you feel a daddy dynamic differs from other kinds of power dynamics? <clears throat> this is actually a question I get a lot. And I, I will start it out by saying, this is simply my, my perspective of, you know, the way that I am a daddy. Um, my father, uh, <laughs> Is, is actually sterile. Um, I'm, I was from a family of four kids. Two of us are adopted and two are from artificial insemination. And yet my father treated each of us the same um, and was very supportive and loving. And he, he was just, I wish everybody had a dad like mine. He's, he's very much my hero. And so a daddy to me is always the emotional side of me. Um, that's the one that gets me to put my needs on hold because the kids always come first. They always need taken care of. Um, whatever it is, I, I will do that for them. So a, a daddy is more of the emotional side of my personality, I guess. How's that? Does that answer the question? <coughs> oh, and how do I feel about being a daddy? Um, a daddy to the community is something that I'm very passionate about. It's a very comfortable place for me to be in. So yeah, I like being daddy. And daddy Don, do you also go by sir and master? And if so, when and how? <laughs> um, I, I do choose to go by sir daddy Don that actually started um, in 2012, I believe it was, I was um, asked to be the uh, the prince of the Imperial Sovereign Rose Court. Um, and sir, to me, that's a very male-oriented um, title. And so I went to the the formal or the you know the previous previous princes and asked them if they were comfortable with me going by Sir Daddy Don. And so I considered an honor and that's, that's when Sir Daddy Don started. Um, I am a master. I am my girl's master. I tend not to go by that. That's a lot for my mouth and my tongue to try to say all the time. Um, I can barely say Sir Daddy Don without stumbling over it some days. So um, yeah, I am a master, but I, my chosen name is Sir Daddy Don. Back to your honey. Oh. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, what kind of, so as you know, Women of Drummer is um, 
a very play focused um, organization, you know, where, where we tout as just being fierce and being out there and audacious. And, and so that brings me to what kinds of play do you enjoy? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm very much a sadist. Um, I do enjoy all sorts of play, although we, you don't see us out in public very often. Um, most of that has to do with my multiple sclerosis. Um, I was very much a, a needle and cutting. Um, that, that was my gig years ago. I um, used to teach classes on it and uh, do seminars with my sisters on, you know, had, had to do it all safely and all of that. Uh, my girl is very open to me, still trying to pierce and cut her, and I I think there's going to be an issue with my tremors nowadays. So, um, yeah, my play certainly has changed over the years, mainly because of my health. So, um, I enjoy caning and flogging, um, anything that I can control without harming her. How's that? Can you tell That's us what you thought about back in the day play? What's the difference about the play that you saw back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the play that you see today? Is there a difference or not? It was, it was scary and yet freeing. We, we didn't know what we were doing wrong. We didn't know how bad it could go wrong. How's that? And so it, it was, and we were learning from, the very few men that were willing to teach us. So it could get wild and crazy and out of control and shit that should never have been done because it, it's like we were trying to figure it all out. Um, so I think in, in a certain way, back in the beginning was a lot of what I, I see from, you know, women of drummer doing now, that, that freedom in your play. I think there's been a great time period where being out and playing wasn't, you know, wasn't the thing that women did, so. Yeah, I think when I met, the very first time I met you was uh, New Year's Eve at the Nine Dungeon, and I was so excited to watch you play your girl, and it was just so beautiful to watch, and and also the playfulness between you two. And, and um, so, yeah, it was, uh, I really enjoyed seeing that. I, someday, someday, we'll get to catch that again, <laughs> you know, after all this craziness is over. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, uh, I'm very blessed in that one, my girl is, her masochist side is certainly meets my sadistic side. And again, we've worked with, you know, we've been together long enough and have worked on enough of our issues that um, I know how to push past those limits. And, you know, she trusts me explicitly and, and I trust her also. And so it, it is just very fun and playful because living in the truck, we don't, we certainly don't have the opportunity, um, you know, to just go and play anywhere or anytime we want. Um, right. Certainly, there are dungeons all over the country, but you know we were we were title holders <laughs> when all this first started, and that's not something that you just want to throw into any dungeon around the country. So there there was quite a, a time period that we didn't actually have the opportunity to play because even at conferences we were so busy representing that it it was just like no, I really wanted to you know, sorry, I really needed a flogging today, and I'm like. Yeah, and my arm needed to work out, but it just didn't happen that way. You know, we needed to represent our titles. So um, it, it's, it's a blessing when we can find a place just to kick back and relax enough that we can just go ahead and play. So, Dawn, one of the reasons why Woman a Drummer started was a conversation that I had with somebody from the West Coast. So I'll say West Coast. Okay. And they said that, you know, Leather dykes, the the years of the leather dykes are done. This is somebody also of my generation who said, Tony, the way we play, the way we live, it's done. Nobody's interested in the way we lived and the way we do live. Um, 
and I had faith that if we brought the play and the fun and just being a badass person, the word dyke, you can claim it, you cannot claim it. Oh, oh I totally claim it. Well, that was going to be my question. <laughs> Would you consider yourself a leather dyke? And um, is our way of living dead? <laughs> is it done? <clears throat> Um, I, yes, I consider myself a leather dyke. Is it dead? Um, boy, it certainly is changing. How's that? Um, I, I think the word dyke in general is a term that's going by the wayside. Um, and, and for me, I'm sad about the, the mentality of that. Um, I think there was a certain, a certain joy and a um, camaraderie. You know, if 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 you found another woman that was willing to say yes, I'm a dyke, you immediately there was an instant understanding of <clears throat> expectations as well as responsibility, and um, I think that is in my mind what has gone by the wayside. As far as leather dykes. Um, I think it's taking a new, I think it's looking different than it did. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I wouldn't say it's going by the wayside. I think that what it was will, no, will never be again though. How's that? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a transition. I asked that as a transition question because I see the questions in the chat circle back to daddy, sir, master. So. <laughs> So one of the things that I know comes up with me again and again is being a covered master and a leather dyke. There's not a lot of us out there. So there's a lot of questions here about what do you like about being a master? Are you a covered master? What does it mean to be a master to you? Wow, that's a lot all at once. Um, <laughs> Okay, what, to me, what does it mean to be a master? Um, what it means to me is that I don't have to compromise. I can compromise, but I don't have to anymore. Um, I've spent so much of my life serving others and making, putting everybody else before me that I realized the multiple sclerosis wasn't so much killing me, but my lifestyle and my choices at that time were. Um, finding a way to, in, in our dynamic, my girl's needs always come first. They, they come way before mine. She is, her needs always come first. But as long as her needs are taken care of, mine are always met. And that is something that in all other relationships has never happened before. I've always put everybody else first, but um, that that didn't leave much for me. That also comes with a huge amount of responsibility um, for my girl's safety and well-being, her physical health, as well as her emotional and mental growth. Um, she has surrendered, you know, everything to me which means I'm, in, I'm responsible and in charge of all of that. So being a master to me as freeing as it is, because I've finally found a way, I've, I've found the words to get my needs met and the words to explain my view on, on life and the world. Um, it, it does come with a huge responsibility, and yet I'm very honored to take that on. How's that? Um, yes, I am a covered master. Um, my girl was in cahoots with um, Miss Rhonda and Tummo from uh, Northwest Leather Celebration. And the day that we stepped down from being international master slave, so this was in 2018, um, there were several people, I, I just wanted to nap. Honestly, I was so tired. I just wanted to freaking nap. <laughs> and honey, you were one of them. There were <laughs> several slaves 
running around the the conference that were cock blocking me. And that's what I'll just say. They wouldn't let me do <laughs> the They kept coming up with all of these dang interesting, sir, can I ask you a question? And I'm like, what the hell? I just want a nap. But um, yeah, I was then led into a room of 50 masters and slaves um, for my covering. <laughs> Listen to her giggle there. What is <laughs> it was literally, she's the one that can tell you just how, I mean, I was, by the time this all happened, I was pissed. I was just downright upset about the whole thing. I was tired. These people would not shut up and quit bugging me. My girl wasn't answering me. I couldn't even find her. I didn't know what was going on. I was just, ugh, I was over it all. Are you saying that our title holder is a brat, sir? <laughs> Let's just yes. say I was a, a helper slash instigator. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was very respectful about it all. How's that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Honey, can you see the questions in the chat? Do you want to ask them or do you want me to keep going? You keep going, and that way I don't have to wipe screens and so forth. Okay, okay. So next question. They just keep coming, sir. One <laughs> um, what do you like about being a title holder? I guess there's an assumption in that, that you liked it, right? What do you <laughs> like being a, a title holder, and how do you best enjoy representing your community? Oh, Okay. First, let me answer, how do I best enjoy representing our community? Um, is those times that I'll get a run somewhere like Kansas City or, um, you know, Phoenix, Arizona or someplace, and I, I know that we're going to have some time off, and I say to the girl, hey, go look on, you know, Mast International or Infet, find us something to do, and we're able to meet different people from across the country and whether we set up an impromptu little um you know gathering to break bread or whether we join a, a party or like you know joining um the new year's eve party it's those moments of reaching out and finding our community and being available to them um most everybody knows exactly who we are um, we still get questioned as if we are the current title holders when we aren't. Um, <clears throat> that's, I, I think the, those are the times that mean the most to me. What did I like about being a title holder? Ooh, um, I didn't want to be a title holder. We, we didn't, we didn't run to win. Um, we, we ran to support Miss Rhonda and Tumuk, who run the Northwest Leather Celebration, and they had given us so much guidance in the beginning of our dynamic that I wanted to honor them and, and create a contest, help them, you know, actually have some people running. So that was in December of 2016. We won the Northwest Master Slave. Um, I remember we're like, now we can just relax, though, because we don't have a chance in hell of, of winning international. N not at all. Everybody knew that we didn't have a chance. But that allowed us to just participate in the whole, in the whole weekend. We didn't, again, we didn't go to win. We knew we didn't have a chance. But we were, we were going to enjoy the weekend, and we were going to be that duo that helped everybody else through it, that could just be there supporting everybody. And so... Unfortunately, not really, but um, <laughs> apparently that showed and we won. I loved being a title holder in the fact that I think that especially in the master slave community, <clears throat> people, myself included, look for our leaders. Um, now that I'm not a title holder, when I go to conferences and whether I'm judging or, or just in the, in the audience, what I want to know is, am I willing to go to battle with these people? We all know that the day, there's no one true way. Um, dynamics are all different. So I don't need to totally understand their dynamic or even agree with it. But what I want to know is that 
I'm willing to get in the trenches and go to battle with them. And I think that that was one thing that um, my girl and I really enjoyed and were really, I, I dare say, good at doing is opening ourselves up to the whole community, um, allowing everybody to come along on this ride with us. Um, it wasn't us alone. So, and I think it, oh, go what, ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, so M says, what does going to battle for them look like? What does that mean? <clears throat> I would say uh, over the past couple years, there has been several situations, especially with major conferences of a lot of backstabbing. Um, as well as a lot of dirt that needed to be dug up. How's that? We'll put it that way. Um, but knowing those people that were out there willing to be transparent and authentic, um, no matter how hard it was, if, if you are going to fuck it up, then I want to know you're going to be willing to stand up and say, I goofed, you know. Um, those are the people I'm willing to, to stand behind those are the battles that I'm talking about. Nice. So related to, <clears throat> excuse me, related to all of that and circling in, of course, you know, I'm Professor Dawn, synthesizing yeah. it all, right? In a culminating experience. If you, <laughs> if you look at all of this, like being a master, having a dynamic, being part of a community, being a title holder, being a leather dyke, how do you negotiate being a part of the MS community and being a sexual outlaw at the same time? Because one has a lot of rules and the others has a little bit more, more fluidity to it. <clears throat> I would say for, for me, in, in general, being a master, being a leather dyke master, with um, a, a POC slave in the year 2020, um, that is as sexual outlaw as I can get. Um, there, there's not much further I need to even think about going. I think I've kind of checked all the boxes there on the sexual outlaw. But again, that's, that's my view on the master-slave community. And I mean, in general, I won't say that they're you know, it's not all about the sex or the play. It's it's very focused on the dynamic, and yet it, it is me, yes. we just... I... Well, we got him muted. I'm sorry, Don. That's okay. Um, lost my train of thought. Oh, anyway, that may not be, you know, the focus of our conferences or even what we're talking about between each other, but it's all certainly there and we know it. And um, I think for me, accepting my mastery allowed, allowed my sexual outlaw to come out even more because I, I have learned, am learning how to be more comfortable in my own skin and with my own self. Very nice. What, um, so in the future, because, you know, you've seen the, the process and the progress of, of women in the community, what do you see for us in the future? Like, what would you like to see out of our women's community and, you know, what we can do better or, or what are we doing good at now that we need to keep up and focus on? I, I would say in general, what's, what we're doing better and what I think needs to continue moving forward is, is self-acceptance, simply self-acceptance. I see so many women still struggling with their own issues, their own triggers, and I understand them, I, I have them myself, but I think um, it, it's a matter of finding that balance of 
you know, being the quiet ones in the corner and being the loud screaming ones over here, um, making most people uncomfortable because it, it's just too loud. I think there's a balance and I think that comes with self-acceptance. I agree. I used to love uh, someone I worked with years ago. Um, used to say you have to uh, give yourself a hug every now and then because you have to learn how to love yourself before you can love anyone else. And mm -hmm. um, and I find over the years that becomes so true. It's a lot easier to be audacious and fierce and really put yourself out there um, to be vulnerable, to be exposed, um, if you truly believe that you're that I don't know that you're worth your salt, and so um, so that's I, and that's funny because that actually helped a lot when I was moving forward to Women of Drummer. I had a um, a lot of people don't know this, but I had a lot of hesitations like do I belong here do I you know are people going to accept me as their representative and especially being more on the femme side of things and I thought you know I I look like a soccer mom that came out of nowhere how in the world <laughs> how we in the this world talk. huh <laughs> we had this talk yeah, it's like, how do I get out there and, you know, and say, hey, I'm a representative of you. And, and um, it really just started internally by saying, okay, you know what, I have to like myself enough to say, you know, I, I'm worth being here. And, you know, and yet it helped to have supportive people around me but if I didn't do that work with myself I wouldn't have believed that I could do what I do now and and represent such a vast array of self-identified leather women um so yeah I totally totally resonate with that <laughs> so uh does anyone else have questions I'm actually typing that right now Oh, okay. <laughs> Once again, we are on the same page, Tony. You know, you are the twin of my wife, Fidget, in many ways. <laughs> and um, uh, Dawn, I, you would not believe this. Um, Steph, Daddy Steph, our friend, Daddy Steph, left me alone in Salt Lake City with my wife and Honey in a snow blizzard for me yep. to just be with these two twin flames and um <laughs> good job daddy sometimes you just do what you gotta do you know <laughs> <laughs> so question just came in what was it like to see from the leathery and leather girl community oh my um you know, to be honest, I I feel that I can't actually answer that. Um, leathery, for one thing, that word kind of makes a little hairs on the back of my neck stand up just because that's a word that I don't understand. It doesn't compute in my brain. Um, leather boy, I think, is what M meant to type. Yeah, there is a, cor a correction. Leather boy, not leathery. Okay, because I was like, oh no, that sounds way too unicorn and glitter, and I am not the person to discuss all that kind of stuff. <laughs> what do I want to see more for them? Um, it, it seems that they're getting very united, if that's a, a word for it. Um, there's certainly lots of groups. Everybody has all new names and, and things that they want to put out there. And I guess if anything is kind of an outsider from those groups, I would say, um, I would hope that they look at responsibility within the community as a whole. I think sometimes a lot of these newer groups um, get together for the play to fulfill their own 
um, needs and wants, I guess, um, but they don't, they don't look at the, the needs of the community as a whole. And again, then it ends up left to, up to others, uh, us elders in the community, I guess, to help try to direct them, um, which I suppose just may be the way that it, that it is and needs to be. I certainly think any, any groups that are starting or any, anybody that needs something different, certainly find a way to, you know, to find your place. Um, yeah, find your place. What advice would you give someone new to the leather scene? Oh, gravity. <laughs> Figure out how not to, <laughs> I, I can't think of the word. If, if Jay was on here, she could tell me the word, um, the frenzy. Try not to do the frenzy. It's just troublemaking at, at the end of times. It, it truly is. There are ways to find your place, to be part of the community, to be, um, you know, to get your needs met, to find your, you know, yourself, so to speak, without doing the frenzy and getting into trouble all the time. How's that? <laughs> Dawn, could you speak a little bit about regions? You get to travel all over the place. And back in the day, they would talk about each bar having its own culture, its own protocols, its own, as we as women and drummer travel to different regions and hold our play parties. You know, there's different styles of playing. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Because you certainly do get around. <laughs> <laughs> and again, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I can really only go by kind of how we joke in the in the MS conferences. You know, um, I I would say that that the the southeast region. Um, they're pretty hard partiers. Um, they kind of go to town, from what I've heard. Um, Northeast, I would say, are the it, it's the brain of the country. Um, they're very logical. Um, everything has a purpose and a reason behind it. Sorry, because aren't you from the Northeast, honey? <laughs> yeah, I had to have two mentors to learn all those rules. It was a long list. <laughs> See, I told you. Right. Um, um, the Southeast, or the, excuse me, the Southwest is obviously the spirituality and the woo of the country. Um, the middle of the country, and I'm not sure if they found their place right now. How's that? Um, I think there's, I think it's changed over the years, over the, you know, let's say the past five to 10 years. They also are very hard partiers. Um, but they're also becoming more serious and more focused, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, and the Northwest has always seemed like the or yeah, the Northwest has always seemed like the heart of of the country. Um, pretty laid back and open and just loving everybody. So, honey, I see that your flame getting bigger and bigger, and I'm I'm ready for you to take your clothes off and dance. <laughs> And it is belting. It's on. belting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure my neighbors would approve, but yeah. <laughs> there is a uh, little little secret that last time that we were uh, doing the fireside, um, I had I was sitting out here forever because I had to get the fire ready before we started, and and um. So I wound up taking advantage of the fact that I can just pee outside and no one's seeing me. <laughs> Little admission there. <laughs> just kind of went off to the side, went off screen, took care of my business, came back, acted like I was just tending the fire. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's one more question and then honey, if you want to wrap it up, we're, we're at okay. time. Um, this is huge, Dawn. Here you go. What does it mean to you to be leather? <clears throat> Good 
good question. I will say what it means to me to be leather um, is following my internal code. And that is um, honor, integrity, service, devotion, and love in all that I do. And that to me is, is leather. I know it seems, it may seem like it's um, almost too simple of a, of an answer. But um, when I first came out into the leather community, um, you know, in my 19s and 20s, early 20s, um, that was what it was about. It, it wasn't, wasn't so much what you wore, certainly even wasn't what you did or who you were doing it with. It was how you handled yourself 24 hours a day, no matter who you were with. So I treat my my banker the same way that I treat the receptionist at the medical office, the same way I treat the try to treat the warehouse guys. I treat all of them the same way that I treat my girl. And that is with that code, ethics code that I carry. Nice. I can attest to that. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great answer. How can we find you on on the Facebooks and all that jazz? Oh, criminy. Um, In case we want to follow all your adventures. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Don Webb on Facebook. Oh, Jay's putting it up there for me. Thank you, girl. <laughs> um, we also have a personal page or yeah, page for um for the girl and I. It's called Sir and Girl Jay's Journey. Um, on Fat Life, I'm Sir Daddy Don. We're available just about anywhere, any place you want to find us. Very nice. Thank you, Jay. Uh, <laughs> what a great call. Oh, there's even our email address. <laughs> Very good. Gosh, thank you all for coming out. And Sir Daddy Don, I just you know I love you anyway, but every time we have these kinds of conversations, I just adore you more and more. You and your girl are just amazing and um, definitely my non-consensual mentors because I've never asked you to be. <laughs> we, we kind of adopted you a few years ago. It's all good. <laughs> so i appreciate you so much for doing this for us and okay. um and definitely look forward to seeing more of your adventures on facebook and y'all check her out because truck funny of the day will have you rolling uh, <laughs> they they just run into so many little quirks over the course of the <laughs> over the course of the travels so um, and I'm looking forward to you crossing through Missouri or when I'm in Texas, crossing through Texas and <clears throat> we'll, we'll definitely have more adventures to come. So, Alrighty. Thank you everyone for tuning in and, um, we will catch you again next Friday, same time with Judy Tallwing. So, so yeah, that'll, that'll be good as well. Just just a joy having you here. So, all right, everyone. Daddy Good Dawn. night. A couple other announcements for Woman a Drummer. Sunday night, the um, Sunday uh, virtual table, all the virtual round tables now have hit another phase. So Sunday night now is called Bloody Sunday Zoom Games and Star is your host. And they have been scheming all week in chat of all these different perverted games to get you off without getting us kicked off of Zoom. So that's Sunday <laughs> night, and they moved it two hours earlier. So six o'clock Pacific time. I know that's going to screw everybody up and everybody's going to be signing on at the wrong time. But it's two hours earlier, six o'clock Pacific, nine o'clock Eastern Standard. Star was nice enough to include it at a reasonable mm -hmm. hour for those of us on the East Coast. On Tuesday night is our second chat of the week. 
Um, it has been the Northeast Chat in Toronto. Now it is going to be Table Talk Tuesdays, hosted by Daddy Jason, Leather Daddy Jason. And uh, M, who's on the call here, has been kind enough to work our <laughs> interpreter staff, and we've been able to secure some monies. So Tuesday night has interpretation, and it is a chat of 30 to 50 of your most intimate leather perverts. And then on Friday nights, Honey's going to continue Friday night fireside chats where she interviews someone who is who identifies as leather and identifies as a leather woman and likes woman a drummer. That's the only other thing. You gotta have to like us, right? For us to interview you. So that's our that's our Friday night. So we're gonna continue through the summer. So um stay tuned. Like we're just gonna do three nights a week instead of every night. And um Stay tuned for Honey. She has a group that is scheming in the South Central that are going to get together next week who are coming up with how Woman a Drummer is going to do a regional virtual weekend and what that would look like for those that participate in a region. Honey, any comments on our way out here? Uh, no, just that I'm happy you all came to join me on this beautiful day. It is the 26th anniversary of me losing my virginity and <laughs> look at where that has taken me craziness 